Hi, Jeffrey. How are you doing? I'm very good. How are you? I'm busy, but I'm good. You're dizzy? Oh, you're busy. No, I'm busy, yeah. Oh, yes, you're going out of town. <laughs> and I'm writing my novel, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's I've written, I've written 16,000 words in a week. Oh, my God. <laughs> you must be buzzing with energy. Uh, well, I'm rather tired, actually, because it's quite intense, the writing. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping I'm not going to wear myself out with it. But uh, Yes. And are you glad to be at the end of this? This particular Yes, the life divine, yes. Um, although, great, great sense of completion for me. Yeah, I agree. Um, almost a kind of... a blues almost right <laughs> it's an end in the beginning also hey marco hello hi hi well this is my second aurobindo call today Oh, okay. So it's been an intensive day. And I've had a friend visiting uh, whom you know, John, Mark Benet. Has been oh, here. say hi to him for me. I will. We, we knew each other on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we go back over 20 years now uh, and um, haven't seen him in quite a long time. I think it's been almost a decade since he's been in Colorado because... Uh, we moved here together, and we lived uh, at the hostel uh, for a little while uh, before he went on to other adventures. Uh, so, where does he? He lives in the south, right? He was living in New York, but he's been moving around, and now apparently, I think he may be staying in Boulder for a little, little while. He wants to start a monastery. Good for um, him. Yes. So he's here actually attending a business retreat. And that's where he's off now uh, and looking for a place to stay longer term. So he's pretty intense. <laughs> and, uh, and he's very into uh, the divinization of matter. Uh, and, he sure um, is. Sure. <laughs> and, then I, and then, you know, going through this last chapter and doing the talk this morning, uh, I think I'm pretty uh, super saturated uh, with supramental uh, energies. And it may just be us, uh, Matteo, Marco, Masi, Doug, uh, and Tony uh, were on the call earlier. Um, so, well, that, that's fine. I, I think Jeffrey. We could it. certainly you know, really? just chat between the three of us. I will be leaving early. I'll probably stay for the first hour, and then I've just got so much stuff still to do. So. You look kind of ruffled. Uh, I'm tired is what I am. I've I'm been working flat out for a little while now. So. And how are you feeling, John? I'm very excited. I've had a, a, a blissful day, actually. The weather here, it's autumn in New York. And I think Billie Holiday, her song, really sums it up really well. It's one of the most, you know... It's very enchanted, the city, just for, just for a month when everything starts turning into flame, you know, and it's really beautiful. So I'm having a great time. Because here it's quite cold. It's, 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 it's early winter almost wow. in Quebec. Um, normally we don't get snow, much snow before, no, before the end of December, and this year we've had several snowfalls they haven't stayed but they have fallen so get ready <laughs> it's hibernation time mm -hmm. i love i love all the i love all the seasons actually i can't choose well i i could do without summer probably <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> because it's just so you know the city is really awful in the summertime 
and I don't use I don't use air. I have an air conditioner, but I never use it. Yeah. So, but maybe, maybe you just need another song, like summertime. That's right. I'm a, under the boardwalk. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> that's the song for me. Summertime is beautiful too. I love summertime when the living is easy. <laughs> well, I'm a southerner, you know, so I I spend a lot of time in heat waves and in hurricanes and all kinds of uh, pestilence. You know, we would get these big dragonfly attacks, you know, hordes of dragonflies, or you, you'd be sipping a, a tall glass of iced tea and at the bottom you'd find one of these ugly roaches, you know, the kind that are like prehistoric at the bottom of your glass. <laughs> you know? So the insects were in the heat, you know, in, in swamp area too. They would just be snakes and insects would be crawling up the porch and into your house. And it was very hard to keep a boundary. So I'm not that fond of summer. I do like it. It has a kind of charm. Um, but I, I do love the, the fall and the winter and the spring. Hmm. Yeah, I spent the summer in San Antonio, Texas, and there was always this encroaching of the, of the, the exterior into the, into the house. I almost stepped on a scorpion. Oh. oh. Um, so I was within you know, an inch or so of, of stepping on it. That would have been, probably been painful. That would have been I, I, didn't have, uh, I didn't have any tantric practices to transform that into bliss at the time. Right. Try. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that you were in San Antonio. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting area, Texas, actually. A lot of rolling hills there. Mm. I, I spent some time there. <laughs> so shall we start? It looks like it, we're this, just we three. I have a bell. Do you want to me meditate? Yes. Sure, that would be good. Let me get my...
Hello, everyone. Hello, Doug. Hi, Doug. Oh, Tony. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Does anyone have a clue as to how we're going to frame this? <laughs> or maybe we want to talk about what we learned about this whole adventure, besides just this chapter. Well, I did find the chapter quite interesting. I found it uh, uh, sort of the dis the frame the discussion of how one might go about setting this up, I found very interesting. How it would happen, right? Is sort of a, how it wouldn't happen, I guess, is what a lot of the, the chapter was about rather than how it would happen. But. Maybe we can take turns just offering our downloads or thoughts and frame it as a really open circle, really wide open circle for way out. Yeah. Um, well, I was sort of, uh, that sounds like a good idea. I, I'll go with that. Uh, I was just looking at this, um, the destiny of evolving consciousness must be then to become perfect in its awareness, entirely aware of self and all aware. This perfect and natural condition of consciousness is to us a super conscience, a state which is beyond us and in which our mind, if suddenly transferred to it, could not at first function. But it is towards that super conscience that our conscious being must be evolving. It sounds to me like the World Wide Web. I find this, um, uh, the whole idea of per perfection, I find kind of appalling. I mean, <laughs> perfection would, would bore us out of our minds, but we want it for about five minutes. <clears throat> and I think that's why we're always going to, uh, you know, this, uh, our politics, the left and the right, on the extremes, the right is always, I think, going to win temporarily, because there's that totalitarian impulse. But once they get everything that they want, they're totally miserable. <laughs> and they're, they're stealing and fighting among each other, stabbing each other in the back. So it won't last very long. Um, but I think the upheavals that we're seeing in the world um, brought about by this, this technology and our evolving relationship to it, I'm, I think he was intuiting something like um, the internet um, because we're now able to plug into, you know, all kinds of knowledge that was not available to anyone but the extremely lucky, you know, very rare circumstances. I think this, um, I'm reading, um, I was listening earlier to Banerjee talking about Aurobindo and Simon Don and uh, the postmodern. And I, I, and he, he sort of claims that Aurobindo was like the first, he was, a criti he, he was critical of, the, of modernity. And so he sort of classed him as one of the first of the postmoderns. And um, he just said some very interesting things about um, this whole, that, and I, I, it's hard for me to put it into words, but all the interesting things he said, but having read this book, I'm eager to read other books because uh, 
like Benerjee said, he didn't put it all in one book. He scattered it over many different books. Um, and each book sort of has its own kind of character and its own kind of audience. Um, and um, so I'm now reading this one, started it on yoga, the synthesis of yoga. And it makes a lot of sense to me having read this book and I'm sure I'll get to other, some of the other ones. Uh, but I think there's this uh, tension that we're all feeling um, as we're all making this transition together. And I think he was dealing with the internal um, rather than the, and the interior rather than the exteriors. But he certainly was aware of the, what the impact of technology was having on India and the rest of the world. And, um, I, and, I, and he was friendly to technology. He was definitely an enlightenment thinker. There was a great deal about the enlightenment that he endorsed, like the separ separation of church and state, which sort of makes him, you know, very different from what some people think of him as a religious figure, um, because he didn't think you could think freely at all unless the church and the state were, were, were separate. So I think he's sort of a, uh, comes out of that, the, the, the healthy side of the enlightenment. Um, but I think he registers this need that you, the technology is going to um, eventually take on a life of its own. And that we're getting so, and I think we're all feeling this, that the technology is kind of run away with the whole show. And that it's, we're in, and there's other theorists like Stieglitz, I think his name is Steger. He's a, I think you may know who he is, Doug. He's this, he's a, I think he's a German, he's a French theorist. But he's saying we're in a lot of danger right now because there are these uh, people who want to control it all. Hi, Lauren, who are at the top, you know, who, who are eager to, to control everyone through the technology, that 1%. And then there's about 10% who want to transform the technology. And then there's about 90% who don't care, who just you know, one info entertainment is fine with them. So uh, I think the, um, those of us who want to transform the technology recognize we have to transform ourselves and we have to uh, recognize that the, the interiors are going to be crucial if we're going to transform this technology and tame this beast and prevent it from becoming just the, you know, uh, being manipulated and targeted by nefarious forces. And so I, but I think it's helpful to think that that 10% who wants to transform the technology and transform our interiors, um, it, you're, you're one of that community already. So all you need is nine more people. <laughs> and you've got it. And so I think that's a, a, a uplifting because I think we're already on, on track actually in many ways, just by this adventure coming together um, and pulling our intellectual and heartfelt uh, aspirations to this forum. Um, I believe more of these kinds of uh, adventures and using the technology in this way, which isn't about you know accumulating wealth or, or selling some product or you know ripping off people so you can exploit them, this is very different from the way the 1% wants to use this technology. And um, the, t you know, the 90% who, who don't care, you know, who are just downloading crap off of wherever, <clears throat> they can, you know, go their merry way. But I think those of us, and I think it will be an elite, and always has been, who are going to want to do something different. So that's what I'm taking away from this text and from uh, our conversations. Um, and, um, you know, I, I believe this, that this uh, text is really about the, the post-human. Um, and I believe he's offering a version of the post-human, some of which I can sign on to, but I, it gets a little too transcendent for me. I'm, but I also don't want to get too imminent either. I find some of this imminence stuff, like Deleuze and... Um, Haraway, a lot of the feminists, it gets a little too imminent for me. 
which I feel, feel very oppressed by. So I, I don't think there's, I think imminence and I think we're totally imminent and totally transcendent. That's the only way I can sort of uh, hold this. And the, this text I think is amazing. Um, but I, but I do think he's, he's, he's going beyond the human and, um, just briefly, there's something that um, Banerjee said about one of his, uh, someone said to him, he just wants to have a human relationship with Aurobindo. That was the request they had of Aurobindo. And Aurobindo said, well, good luck, because I don't know how much of the human there is left here. And I thought that was really cool, you know, that he sort of admitted that he's, um, I think he sort of blew a fuse and has gone somewhere else. <laughs> and I think that's a temptation for sure to, uh, you know, just um, go into these inner realms, which are so incredibly fascinating and very rich. Uh, but I don't think that's a choice that um, is, I, that wouldn't work for me. And I, I suspect it wouldn't work for many of us. So anyway, that's my, my sort of, trying to summarize some of my raw feelings about having read this text and what might happen next. So thank you. Um, I appreciate your thoughts about the technology issue, um, Johnny. Uh, I'm going next week to make a presentation in in France about precisely that issue, uh, which is how to use how to how one how one might set about to design this thing that's being called the Internet of Objects of Internet of Things. Um, to support human resiliency, so um, as a alternative kind of approach to just doing things to increase the connectivity of the world, which is what most of the work is headed towards. But uh, anyway, uh, I don't know whether anybody will listen. But <laughs> um. My takeaway from the whole exercise with um, Aurobindo is that, um, because I, I think a lot of the time I was reading it, uh, it was my intellect was reacting a lot of the time. I think that comes out in the conversations and the comments that I made all the way along. But I kind of feel like having read it now, all of it, I feel like what I need to do is, is let it sit in the underbrain and see what, you know, with a certain stewing on it, what comes out rather than into, keep doing the intellectual analysis. I feel like it needs to um, gestate, I guess, would be a good term for it. Uh, and I think something else could come out of it. If, 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 I, if I turn off the intellect mental part of my brain that wants to constantly structure it that way. So, um, so that's one thing. I am pulled to read Savitri. That if there's another text of Aurobindo that I'm pulled towards, it's certainly that one. Uh, again, because it's less intellectual, perhaps, and more emotional and visceral somehow. Um, and the other text I'm pulled to read is, is uh, Banerjee's book, which I have had on the side all the way along, but simply lack the time to do more than break the cover and, and, and glance at it. So I do feel that I would like to read more about his thought about Orbindo. Obviously, the, 
time that he came in to talk to us that uh, at the end of that first section, it was an extraordinary um, exchange and uh, left me with, you know, an immense um, admiration for the way he thinks and writes about this. this. So that's certainly something that I want to go back to. And I think for me personally, this type of material easily sits well. My my intellect is easily shut off, perhaps because there, there's not a lot going on in there. So I I easily uh, can can tap into that that nothingness. <laughs> um, but I I've mentioned before this is my second time through, and um, there's something special about performing this with a group and this chapter is the first opening up into the communal um, throughout the entire book uh, that I can remember besides maybe a passage or two but it, it, it was focused on the massive cosmology or philosophy um, that he's getting into and the individual and the individuation of the individual into um, various realms of being. Um, so, so this chapter in particular, I, it, it's definitely open-ended there. Um, listening, I listened, read this, and I also brushed up on some of the, the Peacock pages, uh, the audio that's available there. Uh, that came in handy for the long drives I had this week. Um, but, but a lot of what was said there essentially was this was Aurobindo's way of reflecting on his own community. And um, I, I can I can resonate with that the the many passages throughout this um, chapter. I've been reflecting on within my family, within groups that I frequent. Um, and of course, the group we have here, uh, the, the technological faces that I, I see day to day. Um, I don't know how to respond very well right now to what you were getting at, John, um, that we've talked about before. So perhaps we could go there. But um, yeah, I guess that's my, my opening phrases there. I'll give it a, sh a shot. Uh, I'm afraid of going to going off the deep end, though. I think that if I were to get really going, it might take up too much time. <laughs> I would start getting self-conscious. Um, what's occurring to me now is that there was a human aspiration that we began with. The, the, the book that is to say, began with the human aspiration, but that I personally, I feel like I came to this with a personal aspiration. I came to this book um, because I wanted to gain vision or gain perspective. These are not the right words exactly, but it was to it was to deepen an inquiry, you know, that had a res that you know, was already alive in me, and that we had already been working on in various 
guises, but but a, a, a timely inquiry, like something having to do with what's going on in the world, why you know why we're here, what we're um, what we're trying to accomplish. If we're trying to accomplish something, again, the language is not is kind of imprecise, um, and. I feel like I've never really read a text like this. Uh, I haven't read Aurobindo before. I've known of his ideas mainly through Wilbur and through you know other um, commentators. But it's always different to really get it from the source. It's always you know to like reading Gebser was very important. I, I feel uh, this reading has been very important. Just like my initial reading of Wilbur when I discovered Wilbur's books in San Antonio, actually, um, that summer, I think it was 2000, the year, it was 2000, um, when I found his books, they were life-changing, and they set me, they, they, they set my soul on, on, on a certain path, um, and it's hard to know what the impact of a book is going to be. Uh, it's been interesting to have real Aurobindo diehards, like, you know, on, uh, in, the, in the group, um, because I feel that they've, uh, and that, you know, it's not, they're distinct, so it's not just a kind of, you know, mass, but they've kind of realized a certain potentiality of the deep, you know, really dive into Aurobindo and the, the idea that he presents. Um, and I know that I'm going to read more. Uh, I'm, very interested in the synthesis of yoga and in Savitri and in uh, uh, Banerjee's work. Uh, I had the idea the other day that, you know, why not invite him back and do something um, more? Uh, and, you know, how could, we, how could we arrange that and how could we make that welcoming and inviting and, um, and pl- you know, enjoyable for him? Um, it'd be great to go through his book, for example, uh, something like that. Um, but I feel that I got a huge download in this, in this book. Uh, it's still, you know, com- still kind of finding a place on my hard drive. <laughs> Sorry for the technological metaphor, but, um, it's, it's, uh, it's such a complete vision of, um, of, you know, a cosmological, spiritual, ultimate, uh, reality. And, I think it's complete within itself. I think it's, I think it's complete. Like it makes sense to me uh, what he's saying. Uh, and it is, I think, open uh, because there is this speculative and this experimental um, aspect that I think is prominent here in this chapter, especially where he's trying to work out like what is the you know if this is the truth if this idea is true and the supramental is coming down and um, the mental is breaking up and is, is going to become basically subordinate to the supramental, much the way that you know nature in this hierarchical kind of sense is subordinate to not nature really because there's nature cap little n and nature cap capital n which is not subordinate to anything but the way in which you know human beings have um and and the mental aspect of the human being has um become predominant aurobindo sees that being superseded that that by a supramental by a gnostic consciousness and and he sees that happening through individuals who have that realization, but then he sees those individuals forming groups. And, and then he imagines, well, how would those, you know, he, he, it, there's no way to figure it out, how that all works. I mean, that's his point, is that the mental can't figure it out. So there has to be, in the Gnostic individual and in the Gnostic community, a, um, an uh, alignment with, or a, a, real, a unity, really, with that, that divine principle, the principle of oneness, or the principle of self-knowledge, or the, the you know, the sat chit ananda, the being consciousness and, and delight. And that would be the quality of that, of, of that life, of the, the indiv- individuals who 
have developed in that way and then of the communities and then and then the communities would be working on creating that for the world as a whole that's i think his idea and and but it's not the individuals as mental beings in those communities and their ideas trying to try, you know figure it all out it's happening on um another level than that um my language feels very clumsy talking about this but that's um it it that's one of the difficulties of the text is that uh, we we've um we've kind of we're beyond this in in certain ways but we're also way way um not not even close to what he's describing as the as the possibility and so um i love the idea of gnostic community <laughs> i love that idea uh and i'm um I'm eager to just play with it. I'm eager to see where, where that, you know, what the possibilities of that are. Uh, he lays out some really almost the how to, what, what, how, what it would be like, what it would not be like. It couldn't be conformity to a particular, you know, idea. It couldn't be, it would have to be diverse. It would have to be um, really founded in that unity consciousness. Um, it would have to also establish friendlier terms. Like it would have to have friendlier relations with all the other aspects of, the ignorance, right? Like it would have to to re, 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 reconstruct or redo how we relate to our bodies, how we relate to nature, how we relate to each other. Everything would be recon, reconfigured for the sake of the divinity, right? So I'm uh, uh, I'm very attracted to this to this idea. I think. You know, there's a when you're really close to a text, you you can't maybe see it as critically or can't you know put it into dialogue with other work as easily as when you get a little distance with it or get to metabolize it a little bit more. Um, which is why I'm glad that we have the context that we do and that you know we're actually doing this this project of exploring these thinkers and seeing where their ideas lead because I think that's that's why I'm here. That's my personal aspiration is I want to find a way beyond the dysfunction and the dystopia that is um, so prevalent and actually get to that, you know, that, that, that super nature um, in, again, like in these terms, these words are very, I wouldn't, use, you know, I, I wouldn't use them exactly myself. Um, the super mind and all that it's, uh, it's probably not my preferred language. I use it, you know, I'm speaking in those terms because we're here talking about this book, but I feel like the language that we use, and this is what comes with the postmodern turn and, you know, all of the literature and philosophy of the past 60 years, um, like I think the language is very important. And, and I'm, I'm, I think that that's the exploration that, that part of the exploration that we're in. So. That's, that's it for now, for me. Thank you. Tony, Lauren, you were the last two to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. I know, I know. Uh, yes, so, um, mm, well, I'm also very critical of this, just like uh, Edward, you know, I have... Um, you know, when I, when I read something, um, you know, I, I always have a critical voice in me and, um, you know, I have always, you know, I, I can't, I can't hold back some, uh, you know, 
I don't know, let's say some um, bullshit detectors. So if I read something and it doesn't make sense, then it doesn't make sense. So that's, that's just what it is. So I have to be honest, uh, uh, honest uh, to myself. And, um, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, it comes up. And um, I think what I'm interested in in Autobindo is primarily the the yoga, the spiritual practice, which I think is something that absolutely holds up and it really is, uh, so this, this process that, that he describes really is uh, a process that is quite universal and that is the, the yoga of the future. And um, uh, something that that holds up, but if you if you read out of Bindo uh, in order to get a grasp of modern cosmology or modern biology, I mean that that's not that's not why why you read the life divine. So I'm sure uh, there will be a lot of um, let's say people from other disciplines who would be very critical of this, but um, they would uh, miss the the yoga component. Um, so just just for me, uh, you know, I had a I had an idea of uh, just cracking cracking up this this uh, nutshell of uh, those ideas that are there. Just just um, for me. So I I had I had really a, a drive to un to understand it, kind of in order to, at least for me, in order to kind of plant a seed, you know, for my own, uh, you know, for my own life, you know, I, I try to understand this and then kind of grow, grow into this because I don't want to, I don't want to be stagnant. I want to uh, grow and unfold myself and basically, you know, deepen as wide as I can, you know, throughout my whole life. And I think this uh, this yoga is something that really uh, does it and can can do this for a lot of people. And um, I think just by just by figuring out uh, what his uh, cosmic vision is, what his uh, vision of a divine life is, just by mentally fig figuring this out, one can uh, and I can uh, grow into that. Um, you know, before before I started reading, I uh, obviously, uh, I mean, heard from secondary sources about how to bend all, obviously from uh, Ken Wilber and so on, but. Um, I also uh, heard from uh, Sam Harris, for example, who uh, mentioned him somewhere. And he was the type of, uh, well, he said something like, you know, you know he, he took the most outrageous claims that Aldo Bindo made. Like, I mean, this, uh, uh, you know, he, he wanted to change history during the Second World War and um, like the really most most out there uh, kind of um, crazy crazy ideas he picked up and then and then um, hold that up as, as uh, you know what this was about and I really you know I haven't found this once in this in this whole text in those in I never found once in this book that you know it went like totally off the deep end. So uh, I, I expected to um, find actually much more that I could uh, disagree with. I uh, ex expected to at least once found uh, find an occasion that was just so out there that you know. Uh, doesn't work for me, but it was more, more, um, much more, mm, much more intellectual, much more, uh, 
you know, uh, mental even than I than I thought it was. And um, uh, yes. Um, I lost my track, <laughs> but um, so uh, uh, concerning this last this last chapter, um, I, I read it today. It's there's, there's so much so much in there. Um, 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 going into those last pages, I think um, the Gnostic, uh, this Gnostic coming together, um, uh, Mm. So I wouldn't say that, um, you know, obviously I'm not uh, anywhere close to, um, uh, to this uh, Gnostic being or um, being enlightened or so anything, but um, I will use this in my own uh, spiritual practice and my own understanding of um, uh, a, sp a spiritual process. And just by coming to the end, um, I think that at least uh, a few uh, glimpses of this, of um, what he meant by um, by this higher unity and higher harmony and uh, higher uh, coming to, together, and you know, I think a, a little bit of this of this uh, I got in this reading. So um, <laughs> I will stop with that. <laughs> totally lost my track. And Lauren, if you're able to hear us, uh, if you would like to make any Hi. statements. Um, Hello. Not sure if I have anything particularly to say at this moment. Um, I mean, the one thing I'm not really sure, like how how much he really doesn't seem like you mentioned before. He seems to be missing a lot of the, the like lower chakra kind of things, and I think that something I've come to believe is that enlightenment is not like well, while we can experience a blissful state through what may, maybe we can call enlightenment, I think that ultimately it's. it's and if you're enlightened, you're probably going to be pissed off about all the shit that's going on in the world. And if you're truly enlightened, you're going to want to take action or something about it. And like, I like the idea of like Gnostic communities and like having more of these kind of conversations with people and waking people fuck up. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of had an intense day today. Not really intense, but just a lot going on emotionally and thinking about these kind of ideas. Like what does it really mean to be free? And, and, and uh, yeah, I think that that's just my two cents about it right now. Thanks. So we have another round. Can I start another round of? Okay. Well, what, what's coming up for me is uh, something that um, Banerjee talks about. About um, it was predicted by Simon Don back in the '60s that the machines would create ensembles and they would become like networks. And uh, this was in the '60s before the internet had really taken off uh, but but uh, it was predicted that there would be uh, after this the networks start to get more even more networked that eventually they would evolve into small little terminals and uh, he likened this to the cosmic being of technology that the cosmos itself was evolving through this technology and I was reminded these small little terminals of sort of like what we're doing right now. Um, but I'm also reminded that the early, the early cultures, um, when they were the hunters and the gatherers, um, they would form uh, polypodal units, units of two or maybe three, you know, to uh, create spears and bows and arrows and or to build a fire or whatever. They had to have um, twos or threes to share attention and to make decisions about how they're going to hunt the game or how they're going to use this bow and arrow or to set a trap. Um, so there was intention and attention. Um, and it was, and to go out and hunt an animal, you had to have rapport with that animal that uh, participatory mystique, I think some anthropologists called it, you had to sort of tune in to that animal so that you could enter into the weave of the environment so that the, the animal would not notice you, so that you could then kill it. And there was also an internal process, you know, where they had to negotiate with the soul of the spirit of the animal to be willing to sacrifice itself so that you could feed your family with its body. And so, you know, I'm, I think that's all very fascinating that it, that it started with small groups of people who, who were able to pay attention to what others were paying attention to. And it was also said um, by Banerjee that with this, this uh, technology, there comes a time, unless you're going to be just surfing the web and getting swept up into the technology, that's always the possibility, and that's what most people are doing. But he said there, there's a real necess there's a necessity that you decide what you want. That's cosmic agency coming through you. And you have to then, knowing what you want, use the technology to get what you want. And that's a different kind of game. And I believe that if you have the, those interiors that are of that, that Gnostic being, you've acknowledged it or had a glimpse of it, or that psychic being, and that you can resonate with others who are also resonating with their own psychic being, then I believe that these polypodal units can start forming even among people who've never met uh, physically. And I think that's a challenge. And we talked about this actually uh, earlier in the week about how are we going to structure or restructure agency in 
uh, where there, when the community is physically absent. This has never been required of us in the history of humanity to have a community that's physically absent. But that's exactly what we are. I actually have, I have met Marco in the flesh a couple of times when he visited in New York, but otherwise I haven't met any of you. So we're, we're but we are forming a, a network and a community. And I think, how are we going to maintain a sense of agency if we don't have a really strong sense of this is what I want? It doesn't mean just because I want it, I'm going to get it, but I have to know what I want. So um, I think that's, and, and recognizing that not as some sort of narcissistic demand you're placing upon others who may be highly resistant to what you want, um, but it's a, that, but it, that it completes the circuit with that psychic being, that, that Gnostic being, that potential to be actualized. There has to be someone on the ground who's um, going to be able to handle that current. And so, and we're going to blow our fuses. There's no doubt about it. Um, and probably many of us here have done that. So it's a, we've had to recover and, you know, figure it out again and learn from our um, mistakes and sometimes learn from our, our losses. And I, I believe that our losses are getting, you know, greater and greater every day. And of course, we can always just use the te technology just to surf our blues away, <clears throat> or we can do something different. So I believe we are doing our best to do something different here. And I just hope we can do more of it and do it better. Thank you. So I'm going to just make a, a couple of comments and then sign off um, and lead you to the rest of the discussion. I'll look back over it again later. Um, I, I was struck, I was still, I was uh, writing up tonight the, um, so, you know, I'm a member of Goodreads and I do, whenever I finish a book, I always write up a review for it. So I wrote up a review of this one for Goodreads. And I was noticing as I was writing it that one of the things that I really like about The Life Divine, and it's not something, I mean, I think we all are aware of it, but if you look at the book and you look at the blurb on the back cover and you, and you sort of approach it in a classical way, you don't think of it this way at all. It really is a cosmology. Right. I mean, it, it's a it's a complete understanding of the universe as a whole. It doesn't present itself that way, but that's what it is. And I love cosmologies. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I would have read it if somebody had presented it to me years ago as a cosmology. I would have jumped into it two feet first to read it. You know, so. Um, and I'm reminded of the discussions we've been having about the possibility of reading Olaf Stapledon because in, because I think there are some similarities between what Stapledon was ta is talking about and what is going on in this book in terms of cosmology. Um, so anyway, so um, that is a maybe... Um, as, I don't think it's exactly a... Um, it's a playful way to understand the life divine as opposed to, uh, and yet still a serious way to do it, right? So um, the, then I wanted to comment. So Lauren, you talked about the, the discussion we had about the lower chakras and there was an exchange this week um, or last week with, uh, between Heather and I uh, it, it, I, I'm not sure it came up on the main forum. It may have been on the, on the writer's forum that it came up, but I'll repost the video that she posted to the writer's forum because it was about this um, uh, Zen idea of the beast 
and the beast and the role of the beast in light in enlightenment and i think it's extra, it's entirely pertinent and a lot of fun to read and entirely pertinent or to listen to because it's like a half hour half hour pod, podcast kind of thing um but it's entirely relevant to this idea of the lower chakras and and their importance to the enlightenment process if you like um and so uh, yeah so i'll put that one i'll put the link up for that uh and i think that covers what i wanted to say um i i i mean i know there's going to be another wrap-up session i'm not sure depending on which date it happens whether i'll be present for it but i did want to say what a pleasure it's been to be in this adventure with all of you as well. So not just, and, and all of you, meaning all of you who didn't come today, uh, all of you who were there this morning and I wasn't there at that meeting or who, who came at different times and aren't here now, but it's been a wonderful journey as a group. And, uh, and one of the pleasures of my life is a little bit like what you were saying, Johnny, about the virtual community aspect of what we're doing. But um, there is, uh, it, it, it's amazing how much joy one can find in virtual community. <laughs> and of course, um, after my recent excursion to Boulder, I did meet Marco and I did meet Carolyn and I did meet Heather so I, and Jeremy. So I, I have some more um, anchored understandings of what's going on and 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 that's also interesting and has some interesting um i don't know how, how to what to say exactly about it but uh it, it changes the resonances that are in play in the discussions because of these because there's a physical anchoring going on behind the scenes, as it were. So anyway, so that was, uh, so I, 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 I hope someday we'll get to meet Johnny in, 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 in the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. It's hardly it's, possible. Maybe I'll come down to New York. You never know. It might happen. Please do. Please do. We have a lot of fun. Enjoy so, your trip, Jeffrey. Yeah. Thank you. So with that, I'll leave you and uh, have a good end of the session and I'll be back. I'll be back in two weeks, but uh, for whatever's going on. I don't have anything to say, <laughs> to be honest. I had a lot to say uh, earlier, perhaps, but now I am um, I wouldn't mind maybe opening it up to everyone speaking, not necessarily out of turn, but um, as you see fit. So if anyone would like to take my turn, go ahead. Well, I'd like to share a passage from the book, which I think picks up on what we've been talking about. It's paragraph 47. For those of you who are still numbering your paragraphs, that's got to be the geekiest thing I've ever done. Um, uh, I'm going to read a little bit. I think it's worth bringing his words into this. And... Uh, you know, I think he's really trying to figure this out. Uh, he's truly tr really trying to offer like some sense of how this could be possible. How would it be possible to, because it's uh, to Lauren's point, he's calling for action, but he's 
also pointing to history and saying, well, these are the kinds of things that have been tried and have not worked. So we shouldn't do that again. Um, you know, here are the possibilities that are kind of dead ends, like the, you know, the withdrawal from the world, the nirvanic or the ascetic uh, uh, transcendence. It really is all transcendence and all imminence. And I think that that's what's um, compelling about his his philosophy here, his idea is, um, so he's able to kind of identify like what he thinks has to happen. Uh, he says, and I'm going to start just a, a, a little bit earlier. What is necessary is that there should be a turn in humanity felt by some or many towards the vision of this change, the trend, the, the evolutionary change he's talking about, a feeling of its imperative need, the sense of its possibility, the will to make it possible in themselves and to find the way. That trend is not absent and it must increase with the tension of the crisis in human world destiny. The need of an escape or a solution, the feeling that there is no other solution than the spiritual cannot but grow and become more imperative under the urgency of the critical circumstance. To that call in the being, there must always be some answer in the divine reality and in nature. And then, and then this gets to the question of the individual and the community, because in this chapter, he's kind of, you know, how, as he did earlier, presenting the dialectics between those philosophies that see liberation in the direction of the individual and those that see it in some kind of communitarian um, solution. Um, and he's like really, I think, clear that we shouldn't subsume ourselves to either to the ego, nor to the group consciousness, nor to the state, nor to the machinery of technology, like that... Um, it has to be grounded in this divine reality. Um, so the answer might indeed be only individual. It might result in a multiplication of spiritualized individuals or even conceivably, though not probably, a Gnostic individual or individuals isolated in the unspiritualized mass of humanity. Such isolated realized beings must either withdraw into their secret divine kingdom and guard themselves in a spiritual solitude or act from their inner light on mankind for what little can be prepared in such conditions for a happier future. The inner change can begin to take shape in a collective form only if the Gnostic individual finds others who have the same kind of inner life as himself and can form with them a group with its own autonomous existence or else a separate community or order of beings with its own inner law of life. Um, and he, he goes on to talk about this kind of the monastic aspects of that or ways that that might happen. And then the downsides of that, because you have this concentration of people who may have some Gnostic, you know, insight or capability, but at the same time still have uh, other programs, other, um, you know, active parts of them. They're still intermingled, you know, as we all are with the ignorance, with the, the you know, the illusory um, ideas of, of the culture that we come from. Um, but it goes on. I'm probably not going to find this passage because it was a long argument. It was kind of scattered around. He's like, yes, that, that, I mean, that, that could, you know, th th there has to be some monasticism is basically what he says. Some kind of, way that you create the like a con the conditions some protected zone you know where it's okay to be gnostic basically because if you're if you're gnostic in the mass of everyday life you're crazy you know you're like what like, imagine going around assuming that you're not separate from anybody else that there's you know one unitas multiplex you know one reality if you really lived as if that were true and not behind a veil of you know, distanciation, because that's what's enforced by the, you know, overall kind of social political reality, you'd be, you'd be nuts. The, the, like, that's revolutionary. So there's the need to sort of withdraw and to hide. But then if 
people like us get together and start talking and, you know, start peeking out from behind our veils and recognizing, you know, the, 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 the soul, the, the person uh, who's in all of us, then that starts to create another kind of possibility. Um, but it also brings its own, you know, pitfalls, as we've seen in other communities that have tried to, to do this. Uh, you know, the Cohen community, for example, very strongly influenced by Aurobindo, you know, they were really consciously, deliberately, intentionally working on creating this kind of a thing. They wanted to have a Gnostic community and they had a, an ashram. They had, they had a, a, a place in, uh, I think, Massachusetts uh, where they were practicing this kind of thing and practicing even, even these kinds of dialogues. Um, and it imploded and, you know, we don't have to go, that's just one particular example with its own, you know, particular issues. Um, and it's certainly though part of a pattern uh, where, you know, we could look at this kind of guru model and the ways, maybe even the ways that different chakras are treated, the ways that men, women are treated compared to men, or what, there are all kinds of different things that we could look at. But we have to get it right. Like, you know, like not right as in the sense of perfect, but we have to kind of go beyond these fracases and these, kind of aborted failed attempts and, and um, kind of make, kind of make some headway, you know, on this, this problem. Um, and man, I think what's, what's really poignant for me in this chapter is just the, um, like the, the, there's a bit of a warning here around really where to look for that, like where to look for direction, because we need direction but we have to be careful where it's coming from. And, and that, that I think is part of what is really maybe crucial about these kinds of conversations. And, and, this, and also, you know, what I know can be frustrating, but I think what is essential about a, a spacious frame, because it allows a lot to come out that otherwise could remain behind that veil. And when it comes out, then it could be liberated and it can be spiritualized. It could be divinized. It could become part of, you know, the overall play. Um, but when it doesn't, it, it sort of appears in these, in these da more dangerous forms, you know, and that could take the, you know, that becomes the abusive guru or the toxic culture or whatever other um, conditions we've come to associate with these like alternative communities. And so I know people are afraid of that. Like, you know, I've had been burned. I've been traumatized by my experiences in, in you know, a purport, pur attempting to be Gnostic communities. But, um, but the alternative is either, you know, isolation, uh, depression, um, or, um, you know, I know for some it's, it's, you know, they, it's, it's suicide. Uh, so, I think it's, you know, I think that it's, um, it's important that we do this and, and I, I'm, I'm really thankful that you're all doing it. Like we're all here because I, I really would not be able to have this kind of experience like with, you know, just in, in the, in my normal life. So this is kind of making the abnormal normal. And I hope, I hope the abnormal gets a lot more normal. Uh, and um, and that, you know, that, and I know that, and that, that's not, I don't think that's boring. I think that, that, I think it's just the beginning. Like so much of our energy and our attention is just wasted. It's just trapped in nonsense in just, uh, in, in structures, patterns that we really could outgrow. Um, so I'm with Lauren on that. <laughs> like, I think, I, you know, I think we have to really take action and, um, but we have to be, it has to really come from a good place. And, and I think, I think that that's happening. I, I trust that that's happening. Uh, and that we have to still be critical <laughs> too about it because that, that's how we, um, you know, maintain our, our alertness and our, our awareness. Yeah, I think that passage you read from the book is, was beautiful. Um, and 
and I know that he does call to action. I really liked, um, gosh, I can't remember now. There was one particular sentence in that passage that really uh, rang for me. Um, but basically, like, if we allow any sort of authority, we're allowing for slavery and slavery of our minds, you know? Um, and so what is this new system going to look like? I don't think it can be any sort of thing that, like, I think that was something that you said or maybe was in that quote, but it can't be anything that we've already tried before. We've tried all these things before and none of them have worked. And um, it reminds me a lot. I've been um, listening to this um, guy talking. He's, I don't know how well known he is, but he's been putting out a lot of really interesting work. Um, his name is Mark Passio. And there was one video in particular I almost, um, oops, I almost put up on the forum for everybody. Um, I figure I'll just bring it up here in conversation. Um, but he's talking about how do we, you know, how do we free our minds? Um, his sole thing is caught up in like the new age bullshit which there's a lot of new age bullshit out there that just derailing people you know like this idea of that like everything's shine unicorns and like it's all one, so that means it's all good, right? And that's just not, there's a lot of fucked up shit in the world. And if we're going to create a peaceful civilization or find enlightenment, it does have to come from within first, but it also needs to, to have action. And we, I think the, one of the most powerful ways in which we can make that change happen is like obviously coming from within, finding balance from within of both sides of ourselves, the the masculine and the feminine. You know, the feminine is like the nonviolent principle in a lot of ways, and the masculine is this standing up and taking action, like using that the sword of truth, <laughs> like cutting through the bullshit. Um, and if we don't integrate those within ourselves, we can't find that integrated in society and the other ways in which we can step up and make this change happen is to not support the state, to not support the police, to not support the military, because they are our slave owners. They are order followers. They are the ones that are going to come and, you know, take away your rights. Besides some person mugging you on the street for your wallet or something, like those are the people who are really taking away our rights. And if we want balance, we need to step up and say no. Um, that was something that he said in one of his presentations I was watching today, where he's like, the, the lost word of the Freemasonic tradition is no. We are too afraid to stand up and say, no, you will not take my rights away. <laughs> you know, no, stop. And, um, you know, that action is, is going to take more than sitting there in a mass protest while the government's hazing us, you know, while they're the police have this militarized force pushing back on us. Like that's not going to do anything. That's not going to make change just sitting there. Um, yeah. Building communities like Oroville. And like you said, I don't remember what you called the other, what you said that other community was, I hadn't heard of it before, but it definitely has its pitfalls because a lot of times we still want somebody to be in control. We're like so used to being slaves that we're like, oh, you make the decisions for me. Let's put these other people up and have them be in control. And freedom is the absence of rulers. And that's what anarchy means too. It's not chaos. It's, it's the absence of rulership, true freedom. And freedom equals you know, infinite possibilities. 
And part of those infinite possibilities is chaos. We can't be afraid of chaos. If we're afraid of chaos, it means we're afraid of being free. You know, we're afraid of what that would possibly mean. And maybe it will look chaotic at first. Um, but I think really what chaos is, is being enslaved. You know, there's a lot of horrible things that are going on in our world today, and nobody is standing up to do anything about it, really. They just say, oh, the state's going to take care of it. You know? Um, so it's the, the beautiful thing about his work is that he, he really is trying to integrate both of those masculine and feminine principles and say, like, let's, let's balance, find balance within ourselves so that we can find balance within the world. Yeah. <laughs> you guys should all check him out if you're interested. It's, he's a little intense. His uh, tagline is, you can get as offended as you want. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, Mark Passio is his name. <laughs> I, I, I tend to be one of those that has a hard time with um, the voice with the, the go get them attitude. Um, but something that's come through if I'm, if we're focusing on our Obendo right now is it's that Ananda side of it, the, the delight, which can be interpreted as the expression of the, the individual, the, the conscious being, in into the um into the power using power or being with power through through um a conscious expression at least that's how i'm interpreting it right now and i, I know johnny and i um as much as i we, we could potentially argue or bicker over something. Um, we, I was on the, the being side and Johnny was the, the becoming side. And we were, we were trying to understand each other. And he, he's, he's constantly saying that being is so boring. Being or, or the, the side of just being in silence, being with the nothingness and the void is, well, there's nothing to it. <laughs> it's boring. It's, it's not going to save the world. It's not going to you're going to be the monk in the cave in the middle of a mountain and recluse yourself to death while the world goes spinning. Where in my perspective, the being is messy and it's constantly, even as we're like, we're saying here, even the best of the most Gnostic communities out there are becoming a mess and shutting down and um, screwing up minds potentially. Uh, and I don't know how this connects, but I was reflecting on all of us here and I, some of us have met in person perhaps, um, but all it would take is, um, maybe, a, maybe there's a national, like no power week and we wouldn't be able to communicate with each other for a week or, or maybe it, it ends up being a, a month or something like that. We, we, our community would be shut down. Um, we wouldn't be able to have these discussions and where, where would I be? What, what would I do? Would I wouldn't be, I, I might be depressed. I might um, feel, well, my, my weirdness is not being understood by um, the individuals that are within my physical community, but I would still continue on, but there would be something lacking. So the community that we've formed here, for me, is something I, I carry all of your voices around with me. And that it's really uh, been a method, a tool I carry uh, towards the, the outer expression. And so I've, I've learned to not just be constantly seeking the emptiness of my vessel. Uh, but when, and what I've learned with this reading in particular, uh, this time around, and I'm sure there's 
uh, a page I could quote, maybe paragraph 37, but um, I, I got that the, the emptiness, I, I don't know how to best express it, but it's, I always want to say it's a resetting, um, maybe like sleep. I, I tend to, my cosmology is focused on this, the daily cycle I go through, the, the light of day and the darkness of night, or the, the meditation side of things. And this, this nothingness, this attachment, well, not even attachment I have, but this need to go into emptiness is essentially just empty, emptying up so I can be filled again. So I can refill again this time around a little bit better with a few more words from those that I love to allow for me to create that the best expression I could possibly be. Um, so yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I guess I'll stop there. Maybe a, a thank you. <laughs> I think that if you expand your perspective and you take the broadest, widest perspective you can take and seeing uh, life, seeing the world long run and trying to find a oneness, trying to fi find a greater unity, uh, you will see that in this greater unity, there's also obviously the bad, with all the bad stuff, a whole lot of bad stuff. There's, I mean, the bad things, the evil, the, the, the those all those terrible things, they are also part of the cosmos, also part of the world. And um, I mean, that's, that's kind of obvious to me. I mean, um, there's this idea of the, um, of the one in uh, the, the Neoplatonic tradition. Thing. Neoplatonic one, it's, it's a God concept, but this God concept uh, would be one where it, that is obviously not, so you can't say that God is necessarily good. There's the beautiful, there's the, the good, the true and the beautiful, but I mean, it's not always, it's not always that. So there's, there's also the, the ugly and the, the terrible and the horrifying. That's also part of the totality of the picture. And, um, uh, we want to overcome that. We want to um, we want to dwell in the oneness, but um, just I think just recognize that it's there, and I think that that can be then a source of action, you know, this recognition that um, things just don't go away. And I think uh, I also, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I just uh, looked into the work, work of, um, you know, Adida, this uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, a new age guru. And he had this model of this um, stages of life. And I, f I found interesting that at the highest stage, it's still, it's still, um, you, you still, you can't escape the world. You know, you can't escape the the troubles. So you want to disidentify. You want to disidentify from all the bad stuff, but you're still there. You're still in the world, and. You know, you're basically at the best place you can be, but all the shit, it doesn't go away. Uh, you know, I think maybe somehow this could be um, an impulse, impulse for action, but they need, they need to be both. They need to be uh, um, just um, a way of just stepping back and then also a way to uh, to em embrace the world and um, to have a greater unity.
um, you know, early on in those uh, in those uh, sessions, for me, uh, you know, this uh, I don't know this book by um, or this this concept by uh, Mark Gaffney of the unique self, it just you know popped up for me, and um, bought the book uh, a couple of uh, a week ago or so, and I will spend I will spend this month with this book and. Um, just uh, explore a little bit this idea of a uh, unique self because it's obvious to me that all the people in this uh, in this room they have a unique perspective and a unique self and it's basically true for everyone I kind of find this extremely fascinating and uh, I will I will dwell in this dwell in this work for uh, November and um, uh yes um that's that's what i what i will be reading i'm actually quite happy that um this uh reading is over i read out of bindo a month ago I, I went through it a month ago and um you know I, you know i'm happy that it, that it's finished now so i can i can jump into other things. I'm glad to, it's over too. Actually, uh, it's, it's a big book. It's a lot of reading. It's a lot of time. So I, I, I think there there are a whole bunch of other books that I would love to read, and other discussions and work I want to do. Actually, things I want to get done. Um, to I think on a practical level, like make it easier for people to have conversations. Like I, um, I like that there's a diversification kind of pro multiplication, you know, lines of ex exploration, like the dreaming group and the social dreaming and then Katina's work on biblical interpretation. Um, I'm happy that Marco Masi wants to explore synthesis of yoga. Um, and there's, I have a long list of things I would like to explore and, and, and go into. And um, so I want, I want to work on making it easier uh, and making it, um, just on a technical level, uh, and that'll come. I know, like it's just it's just a matter of time and getting organized and communicating and so forth. Um, but I think I think it's. I mean, this to me is a life work. I mean, this is my life's work now. Um, as a, I'm a writer as well, and I write poetry and fiction and things like that. But it's all part of, to me, creating. A, creating a new world, uh, recreating the world. And I, I don't, sometimes I like to be grandiose, but I don't, um, I think it's, I think it, it's, um, to, the only, to me, the only game in town, not this our, ourselves specifically, but, but yes, I mean, because here we are, uh, we're not doing something different. We're not, you know, like John said earlier, just surfing the web or, you know, following the latest, you know, the ins and outs of the politics or maybe, maybe some of us are. I mean, I do follow, I do follow the politics and I do um, pay attention uh, because, you know, I have, I have to live in this world. I have daughters who have to grow up in this world. So I want to be aware of what's going on. Um, but I also want to be anticipating like what is beyond what's going on and what I want to have happen, like what I want uh, and what 
you know, to the extent that there is a we, to the extent that there's a group consciousness, like what it wants or what we want, that's another dimension of it. And then there's the dimension that's beyond any of us individually or, you know, collectively, and what that, what just wants to happen uh, in reality. And that's obviously very important. Um, so you can't just have, I mean, there's no simple way to navigate the complexity of that. Like, I think that hashing it out and trying things, experimenting, taking risks, um, but being, you know, willing to fail, but also being willing to forgive ourselves and, you know, when we fail and um, try again. Uh, I think that that's really what this is about. Uh, and Oh, um, I think we're, we're, we're going to, I'd like to have another conversation in a few weeks, like after Thanksgiving and with the benefit of having a, taken a breath and letting some of this settle. There's so many directions we could go and I want to support them all. I mean, at least the ones that aren't, you know, really crazy and, you know, uh, but everyone has great ideas and everyone has this unique self, like you're saying, that is very interesting, I think. Like, I'm, I love the practice of listening. And, and then I love the space that is created so that when I have something that wants to come forth or crystallize or manifest, here it is. I can, I can, I can um, bring it forth. Uh, it's very, very, um, it's very satisfying. And it's okay that I'm sitting in front of a screen because there's a certain non-duality to this as well. You're not just, you're not really on the other side of the screen. We're not really. <laughs> um, there's all, there, there's, there's a, an interesting, I think, phenomenology that, that uh, um, sort of plays out. Um, but I do also feel drawn towards in person and to creating opportunities for that. And I, I, I don't know exactly how all that's going to happen. I loved that Jeffrey visited. I, I like when I travel to be able to visit people and to, to meet in person. Um, and, and it's so nice that when others meet each other and like the a network effect forms and, um, what do I want to say? Maybe I don't have anything left to say. I do want to say this. I did the, the one time that I, I felt like I had an insight into what Gnostic community might be. It was at Alex and Al Allison Gray's place, the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors in upstate New York. And I was there with my brother and a friend of his, and there was a, um, a, an event. It was a solstice, I think, um, winter solstice, or no, summer solstice, sorry. And I was just sitting in the cafe because there was dancing going on and there was live painting and music and different kinds of activities. And Alex and Allison had given a talk and it was just a, a ritual celebration, but it was really inspired by and grounded in a aesthetic vision, a creative vision, a spiritual vision. Um, Alex and Allison in their demeanor and their comportment um, were not authoritarian, you know, guru figures. They, they were really setting a tone and setting kind of a, um, a sacred space that's really what they were doing and 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 I had a moment a moment sitting and observing what was happening around me and talking to whoever would come up I, I, I was just sitting talk having casual conversations but I felt this timelessness and the sense that these communities of people these events these were happening all the time <laughs> and they've have been happening for Aeons. And 
that each time that an event like that happens, each time that people come together in this kind of communion that is really free flowing between the finite and the infinite, between the mortal and the immortal, um, like that is Gnostic community. And it's, it's, it was esoteric in the sense that, you know, that there was a whole world outside of that that had no idea what was going on uh, you know, in, in the grounds and in the consciousness of the people that were there. Just people going about their lives and the police and, you know, all of the whole social technological infrastructure around us. But even in the midst of all that, this could, this, this event could happen and people could share the delight, the joy of, 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 of the play of possibilities when, when Gnostic consciousness like gnostic you know di- comes into our our, our our beings our body minds um it was a really beautiful experience and, and it was simple like i don't have anything dramatic to report uh about it other than the sense that it was a timeless thing and that it was really very very old uh not not just a potentiality of this historical moment but something that um Has very it's very mysterious actually. Um, so I think I, I think I've, I have nothing left to say tonight, and I'm happy just to listen to what others uh, want to end with because we've got uh, another 15 minutes or so. Well, very briefly, what's coming to my mind? I I um I had the good fortune to work with uh, a brilliant therapist, David Grove, right towards the end of his life. Um, and he had, he created these little islands of resistance around the country and also in the UK and in France. And he was developing this uh, practice, clean language, symbolic modeling, which I practiced with some of you guys. Um, and he worked a lot with metaphor. And he would enter into the weave of the person and their language. And he would convert their their conceptual gibberish into metaphor and these rich metaphorical landscapes would start to emerge and he would get them to draw pictures or make a a dance out of it or represent it in some way that made sense to them but in making sense to them as they represented it it made sense to others as well because there's a communication um, and I, I, um, and it was often, it was reported to me, someone said that he often would, um, people who had worked with him over the years, he would come up to him and say hello, and he wouldn't know them. He wouldn't recognize them. He said, oh, have we met before? And they said, oh, yes. And he, and he said, well, what was your metaphor? And they would tell him, oh, it was a, it was a dinosaur with a, you know, someone like with a sword. And uh, it's like, oh, said, oh, yeah, and there was a mountain and uh, a volcano. And, and he went, oh, yeah, yeah, now I know you. So he knew them, I think, at a deeper level than just the presentation of the physical body. He, was, he knew their metaphorical landscape. And that he took with him. And, um, right, and I, the last workshop I did with him in New Jersey, he... He said that um, and he was he was only like 58 years old. He was a young man. He said, you know, he had a few more things to do. He'd been very innovative for about a, a dozen years. He'd been really cutting edge innovation in the therapy world. And he said he had a few more things to tidy up. And he said, and then I'm finished. And he had a massive heart attack about six months later and died and left all these these little pockets of resistance and metaphorical, uh, you know, metaphor makers uh, without a, a, a benevolent father figure to lead them. <clears throat> and I find that really fascinating. So we're, we were all on our own. And there were organizations that, you know, tried to um, preserve his uh, emergent knowledge. That, that's what he called his stuff. And I'm sort of a disciple in a way because I, I keep persevering and and moving these, uh, these, th- th- this way of working into s- cyberspace as, as I've been doing here. But in a way, 
the persons that have been so kind as to let me ask them a few clean questions. And then they go into their metaphors. And then they show me a picture, they draw it and show me a picture of it. I take that with me. And you know, it sustains me. It's, it's really weird. <laughs> but that feels to me like someone who's, if they've like gone into their inner world and tried to put it on paper and sort of externalize it that way and then to very sort of vulnerably sometimes point out this is this, 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 this. That to me is so much deeper a communication than, you know, the chit chat over coffee over a beer. <clears throat> so, you know, that's where I think the great writers uh, like Aurobindo, who's a master of metaphor, this book is just tons of metaphor. And I think the the best writers are are able to enter into their metaphorical landscapes and to sort it out and to externalize it. So then it becomes, it's out there. And then they can embellish it or, or put ornaments on it or turn it into any kind of rhetoric they want to. But I think the foundation is in, in the metaphor. So that's what I've enjoyed so much about these this particular reading where, um, you know, I'm just not a very cognitive kind of guy. I have to draw pictures, you know, and dance around the room. I'm, I've spared you that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But I, you know, and I have to turn on music. I listen to some of this and I, the only way I can integrate it at all is to put on some music and just, you know, let it take me. Uh, so, or go for long walks. Um, so, you know, we all integrate this material in the best way that we can. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's great to know that we have this, we, we can always go back to this text, but we also have this archive. So a year from now, you can pick up the text and go through our uh, recordings that we've uh, achieved together, doing our very best to articulate some of this weird stuff that we've been uh, trying to put into words. And we, there may be a whole layer of reality that is coming through that we weren't aware of when we were performing these, these actual episodes a year from now or, or, or 10 years from now. And when we're all dead and gone, there may be other creatures who may find these on, uh, on some occasion and say, what, what the hell are those people talking about? <laughs> Uh, so I, I think it's a, uh, my dedication is to the fu those future people, you know. So uh, we're, the community hasn't emerged yet, but it will. I think we just, it's like one step at a time. And our little pods, you know, that we're creating here, these little islands of resistance to the norms, um, I think are going to uh, have an impact. Already has. So, so thanks, thanks to everybody for this effort. I, you, and your metaphors will go with me. You know, John, I watched uh, some of your uh, alternate re alternate reality videos and um, just by getting a little bit into this, I um, what I want to do is, uh, you know, I want to uh, talk to my uh, dad, uh, grandma a little bit more. And, you know, for people who do something like this, I would say it's a little bit strange to do something like this, but I have a real desire to do it. And, you know, I will do this. I will talk to my dad, grandma, you know, and I will, I don't know what this is, if this is some, uh, you know, shadow issues that I have or some unfinished business. Uh, but, you know, I, I will do this. And, um, you know, that, that has motivated me somehow to, to do this, so <laughs> I to share this. I, I, I definitely support you in that, Tony. And, and 
and please draw some pictures and post it. I'd love to, and some dialogue. I'd love to hear about it. Um, yes. You know, when she died, I don't know, just, just one second so for me, kind of, um, I don't know. I just think, feel that I have some unfinished business with her. So, um, um, that's what I'm going to do. Since I'm on a phone, I only have four boxes, so I, I often scroll across to see uh, if anybody else is going to respond. And I didn't know if Lauren was putting on a cooking show for us. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, I, sorry I, guys, <laughs> in no. the middle of trying to feed my son. <laughs> but so I'm here. I'm the, present. I'm totally you're process, processing things, aren't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, I think think John pretty much stated essentially what I'd like to say, and maybe I'll re-clarify um, something I said earlier. Where I, if the technology shuts us down, and yeah, I'd be a little depressed, but I'd carry on. But it's it's not like that. I definitely have developed relationships with all of you here, and with the amount of time and effort that we've put in this project it's it's going to like i had flashbacks of moments i would be sitting in a certain area in a, my favorite park back in tennessee when i was reading this book originally or in the philippines i'd be in my um wife's family's hammock reading a certain chapter on um the rebirth i, I remember the exact spot and the thoughts i was having at that moment and these these memories are deep and yeah these memories are now archived here for this this time around and that's that's doubly great that's <laughs> somebody like tony can learn about clean language and um i learned about slaughter dykes bubbles that's how i came about to uh reading the second book globes and i developed relationships with with ed and johnny and marco and and donna when she was there and and wendy um, who was there for the first two, I think, sessions here. And even though I I might not physically see a lot of um, the people that have been on here, a lot of you, I, I hope to in the future, but there there is a certain level of depth and greatness that's achieved through these conversations. And... Yeah, I could keep saying that on and on, and I, I probably will, but um, I suppose we'll have a chance to reflect on this reading once more and um, continue then. So thank you again, everyone. Well, are we, are we all done? It's like dinner time in the Unger household. I saw a nice cauliflower somewhere there. So, are you making yeah, I'm making pizza? cauliflower yeah. Alfredo Ooh. for pasta. <laughs> yeah. Some vegan action going on. <laughs> all right, well. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. I, before pleasure. we go, I, sh I, I should say Matteo specifically wanted to, because uh, he couldn't be here tonight, and, and I promised that I would convey his gratitude, appreciation, and regards for everyone here. Uh, Marco was also there, and Tony, Doug, anybody else? I think that's it. Um, but anyhow. Uh, thank you, so, Matteo. Yeah. <laughs> and... Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes. I want to thank everyone. We, I mean, we will meet again in two, three weeks uh, to finish this up. But I wanted to thank everyone who's uh, part of this group and who's involved in this. I've uh, said it in this earlier session, but 
I I'm I'm very interested in this and I'm uh, I enjoyed uh, going through this material and um, I'm very grateful that um, you know there are people who are interested in this and uh, for all of you who are stick uh, through this and um, it really um, makes me feel less of um, you know less less weird. Uh, just, just knowing that I'm not the only one who's uh, interested in something like this. And so uh, thank, thank you, thank all of you. Thank you, uh, Lauren, thanks, Marco, thanks, John, and thanks, Douglas, again, for uh, sticking through all of this. Thank you, Tony. Thanks all right, to all of good you. Good night. Bye. Good, night and good morning. <laughs> Bye. Say bye. Bye, Aro. You can push the button. Okay. <laughs> uh, perfect. Bye. Have a great bye. day. Bye. 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 Push this button right there. Bye. Bye.